I'm thrilled to be here. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, Judy. Uh, thanks so much to the beautiful tribute and memory of Pepe. Um, thanks so much to the Jane Goodall kind of tribute that came into us. The Steve, the, I'm looking forward to meeting Steve the Penguin. Um, and I also want to thank Governor Jay Inslee, who shared comments, who is an extraordinary champion for environment, for conservation, uh, and is standing up on climate change issues in this state. And I was on a panel yesterday, actually last night with Jay Inslee, uh, at a local radio station, which is KEXP, which is a Seattle-based station. It's a great independent music station. Uh, and we were talking about uh, net neutrality, internet neutrality. And Inslee was asked a question which made, him very, made me very grateful to me. He, said, he was asked, what's your favorite thing on the internet? And his answer was grist, uh, which I was very appreciative of. My answer was actually more of a tribute to Puerto Rico. I said my favorite thing on the internet was Daddy Yankee's music video, Despacito. Um, <laughs> But uh, we should get him to do one about climate change, uh, and that'll help a lot in environmental education when a billion people see a music video by Daddy Yankee about climate change. So I'm thrilled to be here, and what I was going to start by saying is I was initially going to talk about optimism, and I still am, but I also think it's been quite a last two weeks. And when I was coming over here last night from Seattle, I was thinking there's, there's no place that I would rather be tonight the week that the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change released its most recent report on Monday about what could be terrifying by 2040 uh, than to spend it with the people who are in this country, who are here in this room, uh, who Jane Goodall mentioned as unsung heroes, but who are the basic fabric of what I think is going to be so essential to telling a bold, courageous story about a future for our planet and our environment that's not going to have the impacts that a 1.5 to 2 degree world could have. So what the work is that you're doing here is at the very foundation of that. So I am going to kick off here um, by starting with this slide. Um, so GRIST, as some of you may know, we're a national environmental media nonprofit. We reach about two to three million people a month. Our vision at GRIST, which I hope many of you share, is we're working for a planet that doesn't burn and a future that doesn't suck. And that's a vision statement of our organization. And we're doing that by trying to make the story of a better future so irresistible that you want it right now. And Lori, uh, Lori Lippard is Lippard is that Lucy Lippard is someone who I really respect a lot. She's a feminist. She's an art critic. Uh, she was at NYU for a long time. She worked a lot on the mass production of, of media uh, for social change. And she always asks three questions, which I think as a storyteller, which is what I do, is in, uh, what many of us do is we talk about how we tell stories about ourselves and about this planet we live on and, and educate people around us. She sort of had three, three questions that she led with. What do we want to say? How do we want to say it? And who's it for? And, and I think those are immensely important questions that we'd be asking ourselves, especially in these times. So we've been sitting for a bit, so I wanted to start with a little vote. So for all of you who have your phones, this is going to come up again. Everyone, please pull out their phones. If you can see that, oh, maybe some of you can't see that. If you can see that, this is going to come up again and I'm going to give you a prompt, but if you can see that, pull out your phone and text the number 22333. So text the number 22333, and I would have had to have paid like $1,000 to make it so it wouldn't say this. This was the generic username they gave me. Um, but you have to type in Brady W362 and text it to 2233. It's a lot of instructions. And then you get to cast your vote. And the question here is, do you believe in science? And there'll be a more serious question later, but do you, this is a serious question in America. Um, but the question is, do you believe in science? So we'll give everyone a second to pull out their phones and vote, because once you get this code in, it's gonna come up again. Just so it's working, maybe someone vote that they don't believe in science. Okay, we'll give it a sec to keep the sample size, the sample size evolving. Okay, 
Okay. That, that, those are pretty good results. That's about what I expected in this room. We always have some outliers in any audience. So I, um, we're going to come back to that. And the question that I'm going to give you, it's going to come up later in the presentation, uh, is to think of the word that you most associate with environmental education. So just keep that in the back of your minds. Think about what the word is that you most associate with environmental education. Uh, and don't, don't do anything with it yet. Just start to think about it. So I want to start by telling a little bit of my own, my own story of outdoor education. I grew up in a, in a, my dad was an organic vegetable farmer, works in natural resource management in rural Whatcom County, which is about a county in Northwest Washington State. My mom is a public school educator and she immigrated to this, this country from Cuba. And I grew up playing in vegetable patches, picking sugar snap peas, chopping firewood. Um, and when I went off to school, I ended up leading my, my undergraduate university's outdoor education program. We used to take tons of kids, and many of you have been involved with this, many, many kids every year, incoming undergraduate students out into the woods uh, to bond with one another and also to experience the wilderness and also take funny photos. I went on to spend some time in Honduras where I had the privilege of getting to start an organization called Proyecto Via Nueva, which was, working on outdoor, which was working on taking kids in poor urban communities in Honduras uh, and exposing them to youth leadership opportunities, uh, often through, through doing outdoor hiking and camping. And there was a lot of work that was done with school gardens. This is one of the school gardens that we developed in a very poor urban school outside of Tegucigalpa. I then went on to work in wheat fields at the Gates Foundation. And I happened to marry a marine biologist named Micah, uh, who spends all of his time, which a lot of you probably spend time on too, working on ocean acidification. And we tra we get, we get, I get the unique privilege of, of getting to go and travel around the state of Washington and install these, these, these crates here, which are, are, are actual ocean acidification sensors that are hooked up to radio sensors that you are putting in tide flats around the state of Washington to transmit changing pH at different times of day as you look at the impacts that seagrass has in pulling CO2 out of the atmosphere uh, and trying to mitigate the local impacts of ocean acidification. So that's, that, those are the kind of dining room conversations we get to have at home. Uh, and then I get conscripted out of my office to go and install these sensors around the state in tide flats. But you get to kayak. I also got married, and I'm going to come back to this. That's my, that's my husband. That was when we were both still part of, maybe we, weren't, we wouldn't have gotten to be part of 30 under 30, but we were under part of that at that point. Um, and at our wedding, instead of doing flower bouquets at the tables, uh, at, each, at each table, we thought we'd use it as an opportunity to talk about our own environmental values for conservation, the future of our planet. Uh, and instead of flowers, we went out into the Puget Sound the, the morning of our wedding, actually, and picked up lots of five-gallon jugs of um, salt water and, and harvested some live seagrass that we later replanted and then did bouquets of seagrass instead of flowers at our tables, which we then took back to the Puget Sound. <laughs> so my, my point with this story is actually to channel uh, someone who I have great admiration for as an educator, as kind of a radical educator and an organizer, Marshall Gantz at Harvard, who came up with Cesar Chavez and Dolores Huerta and the United Farm Workers, and talked a lot about how we tell the story of us, how, or sorry, the, tell the story of self, how we then tell the story of us, and then how we then tell the story of now, and why this moment of now is so important. But my own story of self, is, is this one, one that starts being exposed to the opportunities of recreation and the out of doors, having a family that was deeply committed to conservation and environment, marrying someone who thinks day and night about the future of our oceans and the health of uh, seagrass uh, in our state, and then having the privilege of getting to lead an organization that works on environmental storytelling. And the role that all of us have here is, to me, the, the story is of, which I, I'm hoping to, to say a few things about. One thing that I see is so powerful about environmental educators and the work that we do today, and especially in these times when it can feel like we're not making progress, is this Mexican proverb, which I have taken to heart since something that happened in November 2016, and it has given me a lot of support as I've thought about where we are and of the work that we're doing in education. And that is a quote that says, 
when some of you speak Spanish, I, a lot of countries are represented here. It says, quisieron enterrarnos, pero no sabían que éramos semilla. And what that means in English, which many of you know, is that they wanted to bury us, but they didn't know we were seeds. And that to me is really the power of what we're doing today. And when we're thinking about trying to avoid a planet that burns and a future that sucks, We're going to get to this guy here in a sec. When we're trying to avoid a planet that burns in a future that sucks, the work that we're doing in kind of planting and cultivating and growing those seeds as environmental educators is exactly what is going to put us on the track to avert the 1.5 to 2 degree world by 2040 that the IPCC report came out with on Monday. So to put our work in context, I feel like this work has never been more urgent. So now is to bring out your phones again. Um, the question here that I was going to ask is what's the first word that comes to mind when you think about environmental education? So your, your task is to take out your phone and text that, and I'm going to do it too. Oh, great. You didn't need that much instruction. I love that. How did someone do an emoji? <laughs> it is true, there must be some millennials. That Though my mom, who is an ELL teacher, has taken to emojis, too. <laughs> That's really cool. We're going to let that go for, you have, you have 10 more seconds to cast your word. But th that gives me hope. Well, we can, we can freeze that somewhere. Um, I don't think that's going to go away. But I'm going to go through, well, someone's weightlifting. <laughs> I really don't know even how you create those, so there's some innovative people out here. So here, here's what I want to say, is the story that I want to tell is when you look at this world, it came into pretty stark view with the IPCC report to quote the scientific consensus, that there's a strong risk of crisis by 2040. And that 1.5 degrees, which many of you probably read, that 1.5 degrees, to, to, to kind of sum it up, is the new two degrees. And that the, the argument in the IPCC report, which many of you read, was that the negative impacts on everything from increasing asthma rates that are impacting poor brown and black kids disproportionately to the impacts that we're seeing uh, in extreme weather instances and extreme weather events to the heat maps that are happening in cities that are, that are, that are hitting poor communities hardest, that those impacts to the displacement effects on people and, and critters, to the, to, the, to the inclement harvests that are going to impact national security and global security, that those impacts are going to be felt potentially at 1.5 degrees instead of a two degree world. And that that, if we don't reverse that course by 2040, that we're in a lot of trouble. The other thing it said, which is something I think about all the time from a storytelling perspective, is something that seems almost ridiculous. It said that to avert these impacts that we'd have to price carbon at $27,000 a metric ton by 2100 to see the carbon reductions that would put us on that track in time. And just so you get a sense, for all of you, in, and I can't be too political, but for all of you in Washington State in November, we're going to the ballot on a carbon tax that would price carbon at $15 a metric ton. So this, we're talking about a logarithmic scale. But the good news is that change can actually happen really quickly. And it can happen really quickly when we all come together and push for it. And 
I have come to truly believe, and I think there are many examples in history, that when you change the story, you can really change the world. So you are the ones here who are telling that story and motivating and inspiring those who are going to be the storytellers of the future. This is a piece of art that was made in the 1980s by a, Cuban, a gay Cuban artist who died of AIDS in 1991 named Felix Gonzalez Torres. And he was a artist who did large visual displays in New York, in particular, to draw attention to HIV and AIDS. And these were two billboards that went up in 1988, not long before he died, that were done on two billboards in Manhattan. And one of the billboards that you can see says, someplace better than this. And the other billboard said, no place better than this. And this is just as AIDS was starting to reach the epidemic levels that killed, are continuing to kill millions of people across this planet, but we're hitting their peak mortality rates in the United States. And it presented a choice. And I, I think that is the choice that we are now facing on climate as a human community. And this is a slide that gives me hope. And I'm going to talk a little bit about some specifics here. I think many of you have seen this before. But, but what this slide tells is the story that change can happen quickly. So if you look across time, on one axis there, you see the number of states in our country who have adopted changes on certain pieces of pretty monumental policy. On the other axis, on, on the x-axis, uh, you have time. And the issues that you see there are things like Loving versus Virginia and interracial marriage. Um, you see marriage equality there. More recently, you see how quickly public opinion and politics have changed around the legalization of cannabis. Um, you see women's suffrage there, uh, and how quickly the movement for women's suffrage spread. And one thing that is true actually across, I mean, a lot of these, a lot of these patterns date prior to serious public opinion polling. But one of the things that you see throughout each of these examples is a really common pattern. And that pattern, is the more people that you know and who you trust who believe a certain thing, the more likely you are to believe that thing. So in 2012, when we went to the ballot in Washington state on marriage equality, which I was very involved in, we went to the ballot on marriage equality in Washington state. We were the first state in the country to pass marriage equality at the ballot. Maryland and Maine and Minnesota did it the same year too. When we did that in 2012 in Washington state, the public opinion polling that we had going into that election was that somewhere between 70 and 75% of people in Washington state knew somebody who identified as gay, lesbian, or bisexual, or transgender. Um, that number is now up to 86%. But if you actually look back in time at, at people who knew people in interracial marriages, or you people who, who knew women who were pushing, that, that goes you know, back to 1919, but people who were pushing for, for women's suffrage, that same pattern comes to bear. So as we're thinking about the generation of young people who are in public education today, uh, and I should give a, a shout out actually at this point to um, efforts like Senate Bill 720 in California that passed to create environmental literacy for all. Um, <laughs> efforts like that are creating a generation that's gonna come of age as the activists in 2040, uh, who will be at the forefront of making the decisions at just the time when some of these bold, ambitious policies around culture are going to need to be put in place so that we see the kind of change happen at the scale that it needs to happen to change the course and the future of our environment and our climate. Um, and that's why I'm hopeful, because I think that those graphs and, and environmental issues, I think, are different for many reasons as well that I bet many here have more sophisticated thoughts on than I do. But there's a story to be told there that change can happen quickly. So I don't think it is outside, well, I love the outside the box New Yorker cartoon, but I don't think that it's outside the box to believe that carbon should be a luxury. And that as we look to a future that doesn't have carbon that we depend on so deeply, we're going to create a more just future along the way. So this is one of the things we're working against in telling that story, is that this is a, a very busy slide, but don't pay too much attention to the specifics. 
What it's saying is in 2016, it looks at people who listen to different kinds of media. And, and what it's saying is that people who self-identified as conservative and people who self-identified as liberal listen to media that they associated with those perspectives. And that echo chamber that we're talking about so frequently in media today is something that is, I believe, one of the core challenges we need to overcome because what we're discovering in storytelling, and you probably see this in classrooms and populations and communities you're working with in national parks and conservation, just across the country, you're probably seeing the reality that data back up and support that the messenger actually matters often more than the message. So who tells you something or who shares that thing with you often matters more than the thing that's being said. Which brings us to this point, which to me is behind this pattern, which is trust in America has been going down. And what you find going against this trend of trust is that people are increasingly trusting less media, less academics, less institutions, even though 93% of people in this room trusted science, even though I bet it's actually closer to 100%. Um, even though 93% of people in this room trusted science, what's, what, what, what is going against this trend is actually people are increasingly trusting the people that they know and they love. And, and that was the same kind of pattern that has gotten us over the edge in other storytelling in the past. So that's why the work that's happening in classrooms and in public education, uh, to me, is so important today in a time when the internet and the way that that content is, is both served and targeted so that people can actually live in an echo chamber more easily. Uh, these personal relationships and education, and environmental education, become so much more important because what we found in a lot of the victories that were won before, it came through these personal relationships. So this brings me to, to Lucy Lippard's second question, which is how do we want to say it? And the first one is what keeps me up at night the most. And that is that I frequently worry that the scale of the solutions that we're putting forward in our daily lives are insufficient to the scale of the problems that we're trying to address. And what I mean by that is that and this is, this is not a knock on plastic straws, because I do think we should be reducing plastic straw consumption. We, we got to get rid of plastic straws. It's a good thing. Let's, let's get rid of plastic straws in cities and schools and country and in, in, in states and in places around this country. But that alone isn't going to put us on a path to the 2040 emissions reduction targets. It's not going to, in and of itself, get rid of the ocean's plastics issues that we see. It is a tool to engage people, but we also have to be thinking big. So I, I believe this is a time for radical imagination. It's a time for us to be thinking in our daily lives, what is the more radical idea? And I don't mean radical in a political sense, but radical in, in, in kind of impact sense that we can be having in our lives as we go about the stories that we're telling that I'll share a few examples of. The second piece I think is equity. What we found time and again is that it is so important now more than ever, it's always been important, but representation of the communities that are most impacted uh, by climate and environmental health, uh, that those would be the communities that are also at the forefront telling the stories. And we're seeing that in Washington State today where we have a coalition of 40 community of color-led organizations that are the ones that wrote and are behind the carbon pricing legislation that's going to the ballot here in November. And that is so important. I've gotten to know someone who, some of you will know who is, who is one, a, sane, a, a sane administrator of the EPA at one point. Um, well, not he was, he continues to be, but others have not been in certain times, which I, I shouldn't go into here. Um, <laughs> So what I was going to say is that Bill Ruckelshaus, who was an extraordinary leader at the EPA for many years, he was actually under Nixon and then under the first Reagan administration, actually lives in Seattle now, um, very thoughtful bipartisan leader. Um, he was really spearheaded the passage of the Clean Air and the, was very involved in the passage, I should say, of the Clean Air and the Clean Water Acts in the early 1970s. And his point that he will say time and again, he's in his mid to late 80s now, 
is that when you connected the issues, that this is what you do every day, but when you connected the issues of environmental degradation to people's everyday health, that we started to make progress. And what's so important to that story today is that the communities that are most impacted by these environmental, environmental justice issues uh, are communities that are left out of our system, brown and black kids, brown and black families, uh, families that are at risk of many, many other things, but who are bearing you know, the brunt of soil toxicity to, to asthma rates. So I think it's so important in our lives to be putting those communities at the front. And the last thing is to empower people to act. So this, this, is, this is grist, but I mean this is our, I brought up our line before, a planet that doesn't burn and a future that doesn't suck. Um, and I think it is so important as we're talking about climate to tell a positive story, to tell a story about a better future, uh, because we see this a lot at grist, that climate depression is a real thing. You can disengage. And there was a very depressing report that came out on fuel emission standards from the administration a few weeks ago, maybe some of you followed it, in which was buried a lead that we reported on, which was the arg articulating the argument that we shouldn't be reducing fuel emission standards because you couldn't reduce them fast enough to have an impact on climate, so we shouldn't do it at all. And, and that's a really dangerous argument to make. Um, because you start to wind up in a place that we all know. So these, these are kind of ways that we are telling stories about solutions. We, we try to use a, an irreverent voice to connect to people, but this is a story we published a couple weeks ago called Our Avocados Toast. And talking about how we can change our food system to improve uh, avocado production. Uh, this, is, this is a story, we run a lot of stories talking about environmental justice and equity. We work with a lot of national groups that are focused on just transition, so looking at how we can transition off extractive industry economies in ways that also provide employment and clean energy and other ways to workers in these communities, uh, which is a, a, huge, a huge issue that many of you are probably working on. So this is a story about a neighborhood in Kansas City uh, that was looking at how it could transition off of some dependence on, on fossil fuels. And then this is something that, that we think a lot about, and hopefully it could be a tool to educators. Every year we publish something called Umbra is our advice columnist. It's, it's, a, it's an advice columnist, and she answers everything from questions like, should I pee in the shower? Is that good for the environment? <laughs> to, to more systemic questions of, how do I get my friends to vote? And this year, well, that, this is from last year. This was up for a National Magazine Award this year, but it, it, it was her civic action guide, which in April around Earth Day, Umbra, who's a fictional character, published her 21-day apathy detox guide, uh, which was geared towards civic action for the environment. So this is about empowering action. So I'm going to close with this because we all think about, I, I constantly think, also worry about this question of, Am I just speaking to the, same, to the same people again and again, right? Are we breaking beyond people who agree with us? Are you moving beyond that chart, which was in that earlier slide that had the red bubbles and the blue bubbles? Are you bridging to people with whom you disagree? And are you building the kind of coalition that is going to effectively be able to put this country and hopefully our planet on a track that by 2100, carbon does cost $27,000 a metric ton. And the way I see it is in three parts. One is we've got to do everything we can to equip the believers, the people that we agree with, and that believe the things, the values that we have in common, equip those believers with solutions that matter. And that's so important that in our lives, when, we be, when we, we're talking to audiences we agree with, we think bold. We think about $30 a metric ton instead of 15. We think about what else we could be doing that moves us forward faster. The second thing, and we see this a lot in polling, is that there are a lot of people out there who agree that climate and environmental issues are, are problems, but it's not their top priority. It might be like 6th or 7th or 12th or 15th on their list. So the question there is how do we tell a story, and it, I think it's being told when you have hurricanes like the hurricane that's hitting the Florida panhandle right now, um, 
It's being told by extreme weather. But how do we tell a story um, that, that brings urgency to the apathetic? And the last piece, which in some ways is the hardest, uh, is how do you build bridges to people that you disagree with? And I think you, you all have more insights on that because you work in education every day. And maybe it is with the next generation. Um, it, we've been working more with moderate and conservative millennials uh, and thinking about how we can talk about environmental issues uh, to Gen X and, and, environment, and, and millennial groups on the environment. Um, finding places of common ground and building bridges I also think is essential. So I, when I think strategically and tactically about how we tell a story that gets us on a path to a planet that doesn't burn and a future that doesn't suck, I think about it in these three ways. How do we empower and equip the believers? How do we bring urgency to the apathetic? And then how do we build bridges to people with whom we might not agree? So I, I am going to close there. I am thrilled that you all invited me to be here uh, with you at this really important convention in Spokane. I'm going to stick around and go see the, the video promo for Steve the Penguin. Uh, and. Uh, I would love to open up to a couple questions uh, before we close the evening. So thank you so much for having me. And, uh, we have mic runners, so raise your hand if you've got a question. Thank you for this inspiring talk. Um, my question is, as a, a CEO and in a way as an environmental leader, and many of, of us in here represent an academic audience who struggle to say, look, we've discovered so much, but we'd like to get it out there. And how have you seen from your, your, your great place of influence relatively in our field for how that information travels into your channels most effectively? It's a great question. Um, my belief is, in general, when you look at the opposition, because there actually are, there is a group of people out there, they might not say it this way, but there is a group of people who want a planet that burns and a future that sucks. I think it's important to think that there's an opposition. Um, and that opposition, uh, I think has understood something for a long time, which is you need to invest much, much more in storytelling and culture change. And to quote um, someone named Andrew Breitbart, whose last name bears the name of a publication, um, he said that there's nothing upstream from culture. Uh, and I, I think that that's so true. And I, I, um, my advice to that point would be to, to think that everything we do in science needs to be kind of equally, <laughs> or at some level, investing in the way we tell the story of it shouldn't be like an impact strategy from that science. I think it should be part of how we conduct it. Thank you. I'll do one more. OK, great. Hi, sir. Uh, my name is Ben May, and thank you so much for your incredibly inspiring talk. Um, as an environmental activist myself, and I'm sure there are many environmental activists here, there's a hard, t there's a, there's a very difficult time distinguishing between what's tangible and what needs to happen. And especially with our current political climate, um, how do you suggest, in your amazing experience in government um, and just in grassroots movements, how to um, get things that need to happen to become tangible, even with an incredibly strong opposition. Thank you. When you look at how serious the problem is, uh, I, I've come to the belief, and I actually, my ch I've changed my mind on this over time. I think, again, not to say radical is like a, a political perspective, but the, the belief that things need to change significantly. Um, so if you define radical as the belief that you need significant change, um, I, I have come to the belief that, that some of the, 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 the advocacy and the activism for, for a future that looks very, very different is really needed. So I, I, I look to things like 
the protest movement at the Dakota Access Pipeline or the efforts that we saw. I was just, at, I was speaking, I was at the Global Climate Action Summit, which probably thousands of other people were too in, in the Bay Area, and it was fascinating to see the counter protests to Jerry Brown happening there. I mean, Jerry Brown, here was, here's a governor standing up and saying California wants to lead when the country isn't on climate. Yet at the same time, you had massive counter protests to Jerry Brown because he was not, he was not banning fracking in the state of California and was still had a position on natural gas as a bridge fuel that a lot of communities in this country, indigenous, a lot of communities in this country don't see as the right path to reducing emissions. So I, I come down on the belief that, that we need to push even people who are in positions of power who seem to be on the side of, who are on the side of what's good and right on this issue. I, I not to say that it's time to kind of strap yourself to the, the oil pipeline, but I, I do believe that that's so needed these days. Oh, okay. Um, so I'm from high school, and one of the like points that really spoke to me was bringing urgency to the apathetic, because that's something I just really feel like we see with students. It's almost like they've seen these things over and over again, and it just hasn't been effective that they've almost become numb to it. And I just kind of wanted to ask, why do you think that's happened, and what do you think we could change so that there is this urgency when the people have become numb to these problems? I would be really curious to hear, you don't need to, I, could, I would love to ask you later why you, do you, if you feel like your friends are apathetic because they feel numb to it. Um, but I, I think some of the most powerful work that we're seeing are kids who have a moral, a moral authority on this issue, who are doing things like the litigation that our children's trust is bringing to establish a constitutional right to clean air and water. And that kind of work, That kind of work, though it might not succeed in this current U.S. Supreme Court, that kind of work is going to win. That, that kind of work is going to win in states. It's going to win in international courts. It's going to win eventually in the U.S. Supreme Court, I believe. But, but I, I think the moral authority of kids on climate and guns and a few other issues right now is what can move us forward. Sure. So with that, thank you all so much, and I'll be around. I'd love to talk to you. Thank you, Brady. That was so inspiring, scary and inspiring, and we really appreciate those words, and we look forward to continuing to follow your career and Grist. Thank you all for being so patient. A round of applause for Brady. Have a great night, and we'll see you tomorrow. Thank you so much.